So for the last five years, I started a charity that rescues girls in Nepal out of child contract labor, bonded labor. And uh, girls between the ages of six and probably 12, 13 get sold annually for about $25, $30 a year. From just based on sheer poverty. Nepal is a very um, misunderstood country. Has anybody in the room, first of all, been to Nepal? Because usually there's one or two, and, and we have a very a romantic idea of Nepal as North Americans. We really do. Because we think, you know, we're going to fly into Kathmandu and listen to a little Bob Seeger, and then maybe I'll head up to the Himalayas and do a little yoga, you know, with some monks. And, and you can do that, but Nepal is. Um, now, on the north is, is bordered by China, Tibet, and on the south, bordered by India, and there's a little part of the country that's bordered by Bangladesh. And, and it's a, a very impoverished country. The, the stats are very similar to Haiti, about 70% illiteracy rates, and, and the average um, poverty line income is less than a dollar a day. So it's, you know, all those kinds of things are, um, are, are fostered by poverty. So how I try to position the ideas, you know, because we can't in our heads even fathom, could, try, could you fathom selling your daughter to go away for a year who's six years old. We can't even put it in our heads, right? But this is how they think. These girls have never even had the thought. And try to imagine never having the thought, what might I want to do when I get older? See, we, we can't fathom that because we have had that thought. We we're brought up on that thought. They were never brought up on that thought. So every time I speak, I bring scarves. And I sell scarves, and for the last five years, Scarf sales have basically rescued about 750 girls out of child contract labor, and I put them into school. And what's amazing is that what education does for us, I mean, tr truthfully, and the fastest progress we've made, not only we've rescued all these girls, they started doing literacy programs for their moms. Because what that's done, the fastest change has happened because we've taught the moms how to read, write, and do, not, and do uh, math, basically. Um, so, I sell scarves. So last year, here's the story. Last year, my husband says, Linda, he goes, if you think you're a good scarf salesperson, now, he goes, you got to go to Nepal, because I'd never been. If you go to Nepal, he goes, you'll be amazing, because it's going to rock you, right? I'm going, OK. And you know what I thought? I don't think I can handle it. That's what I thought. So what did I do? I buy him a ticket, because I just don't want to go by myself. Now, my husband had a little bucket list item for going to Nepal, and I had a bucket list item going to Nepal. I want to go and see the girls in the villages. He says, well, if we're going to Nepal, we better trek up to base camp of Everest. So I thought, OK. <laughs> it's a good photo opportunity. That's what I thought. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So in my little community, there's a bit of a hill. It takes about a oh, 45 minute round trip to go up and down, up and down. That's what I did for six weeks to train. Up and down. This is a joke, by the way. Up and down, think, oh, I'm getting fit. <laughs> Here's how, it, where I live, I live at about 1,000 feet altitude. I don't know what the altitude is here, but it's probably about the similar, 1,000 feet. You fly out of Kathmandu into a little teeny town called Lukla. And you can, I don't know if you can see this photo, but you, I, that's from the airplane I was in. We dove down and drove, uh, drove and landed on this runway. I read later, it's one of the shortest runways on the planet. <laughs> but it's uphill. I thought, well, that's great. <laughs> it's also downhill when you take off, but 14 days later, after not showering for 14 days, you don't care about much. At the end of the runway, you have uh, your porters and your guides and your Sherpas who are going to literally help you carry your behind and all your stuff up this hill for the next 14 days. So we land, and it's 9,400 feet. And I'm all lightheaded. I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe just because I'm excited. <laughs> See, it's not so much the exercise that kind of rocks you. It's the what? It's the altitude. So oh, it's a dark picture, I apologize. Um, what you can't see here is a young man who's probably 14, 15 years old, carrying 12, 12 foot copper pipe on his back up for days and days and days. They I mean, the only way up is on foot, and the only way out is on foot, unless, of course, you get a helicopter ride, which means you're probably not conscious. Because seriously, and, and helicopters go in and out of this area every day because people die up there. And I'm not talking summoning Everest, I'm just saying get into base camp. We are so unprepared, most of us, when we get up there. Here, if you can see it, it's my, me and my son. <laughs> and um, this photo was taken in front of, uh, in front of um, Scott Fisher's memorial. And I don't know if you've read the book Into Thin Air or you've seen the movie Into Thin Air. That Scott Fisher was one of the lead guides who passed away in that expedition. They lost a lot of people on that expedition. And uh, we're smiling. We're at about um, 16,300 feet at this point. Those smiles are fake. 
because I'm really, really sick with altitude sickness and Kevin's just not admitting he is yet. So that's one of those wonderful traits of our male counterparts is that they're stubborn as all get up, right? He's like, oh, I'm just tired. <laughs> So if I could explain to you what altitude sickness feels like, it is like the worst red wine hangover you have ever had, but you have to add vomiting and diarrhea and whoo, <laughs> it's a party. <laughs> now, to t I mean, you have to understand, I am a princess, there's no question, I thought I was going to toughen up. I thought for sure I'm going to toughen up when I go to, to Nepal. I never really toughened up enough. Because you have to understand, at this altitude, when you go to bed at night, there, well, there's no heat in the room. So you're sleeping in a boat. Oh, I'm trying to think of the conversion. Minus 15 Celsius is uh, cold. <laughs> I don't know what the conversion is. It's cold. And uh, anyway, so there's no place that can, when you're that sick out to make you feel comfortable. This is the best picture I could possibly ever show you of Kathmandu. It's just crazy mayhem. Lots of pollution. Lots of garbage, poverty. Lots of animals everywhere. And uh, this is why I went, was to see these girls. And the reason I talk about this project is that as an adult in her 50s, who's lived a very privileged life, there's no question, you know, I mean, and all of us, we, look, we just had a beautiful day, a beautiful meal. I don't know any of you, so I'm just gonna make a, a giant leap of an assumption. We live, we're, we're privileged, right? When I went there, I did something outside of myself that had absolutely nothing to do with me, and it was the best thing I've ever done. So how I position this is I always say that no matter what's going on for you, and I, I know that probably in this room some of you are volunteeraholics, I, I know that for sure, but just I always say choose a slice of the planet. Whether the slice is right out your door or in your community or across the globe, choose a slice of the planet and the smallest gesture makes unbelievable, I would have never thought, you know, five years plus a day ago, I would, this would, the effect would have been this big, that's all I'm saying. It doesn't take a massive amount of energy to uh, contribute to where we live on the planet. We are very, very connected all over the world. There's just an average classroom. There's 80, 90 kids in every class, and so literally in four months, my husband and I and another group of people are going back to build classrooms because we need space. We've just filled them so much, they're crammed to the rafters, we're gonna build some classrooms. And the kids in the villages, and it was, um, that's how I felt most of the time, completely exhausted, and that's how you celebrate anything when you're done. <laughs> Cold beer. <laughs>